Today, we're thrilled to have Kathy Cousins as our guest. Kathy is an award-winning jazz soul vocalist from Detroit who is internationally recognized and has toured across the world. A seven-time ASCAP award-winning composer, Kathy has been a chart-topping artist. Her album, Uncovered Soul, reached number one on several occasions, including number one on the indie soul chart, Solar Radio, and it was named Jazz Album of the Year. Kathy also is a renowned painter, dedicated teacher, and arts advocate. Most recently, Kathy will be leading the Diva Jazz Orchestra in her latest project, Rhapsody in Boop, an evening of song celebrating the music of Broadway Hollywood star Betty Boop. Thank you for being with me on Hannah's Corner today, Kathy. Thank you. It's great to Thank be here. Great. You know, I was thinking about this. Most artists these days, you know, they specialize in one area, you know, be it composing or performing or recording, and, and you do it all. You do it all. What do you see as the advantages of working within each realm of the music industry? Well, you know, I started in rock and roll in the a long time ago. <laughs> and it sort of morphed into R&B and then I became a, a songwriter for other already established artists. And then I had a couple of uh, 12 inch dance singles out in the mid 80s and I was also at the same time a background vocalist uh, for many a project in the city of Detroit including the famed band Was Not Was and there were a lot of offshoots so I was constantly writing and arranging um, background vocals and then contracting the singers at the same time all that was going on I started developing um, a big band library, a, a, a 16 piece jazz ensemble for mostly orchestras like society orchestras. Um, that's how it started. And then I ASCAP paired me up with a couple of phenomenal co-writers. I was always writing and co-writing and my couple of my long term co-writers, including these people are still working with me today. Um, we ended up writing my first album in 1995, All in a Dream's Work, which uh, was my first jazz album. So I sort of, you know, I never thought about it. It was just one day I woke up, the next day I woke up, there was always a project, I was always busy. It, it was like a domino effect. One door opened another, opened another, opened another, and I got involved with a wide, cast of characters, a huge array of, of people. And a good many of those people are still in my life today. And we're going back 40 years. So, um, and then, and then um, all uh, Uncovered Soul, my sixth commercially released album, it, it's, it sort of came full circle. I had five commercially released jazz albums, all charting, um, on the jazz on the jazz charts uh and then i decided for my six al and not only did they chart i was touring 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 and some of these were specific projects like my number four album to the ladies of cool which came out on resonance records um and is a modern exploration to the west coast cool movement and it celebrated the artistry of Anita O'Day, Julie London, June Christie, and Chris Connor. And I came up with the concept. I came up with these four women who were really the prototypes of the West Coast Cool Movement. And then the bridge from that album to my current album was an album called uh, The Space Between. And I really started thinking at that time, I want to go back to my R&B and soul roots because that's where I started. And so Uncovered Soul was a real hybrid of um, songs that I wrote, song, undiscovered gems that I really had to pick through a lot of material to find, like a Curtis Mayfield song titled Miss Martha, like a Eugene McDaniels song titled Don't Get Me Started. And uh, some of these songs not only took on a life of their own, 
we've reimagined several songs from that album from the ground up, which became singles a year after the album was released. Mm. And um, the album crossed, it crossed genres. It went into the jazz genre. It went, I had jazz promotion people uh, working that record. And then it crossed into the indie soul and it even crossed into the smooth jazz market, which was mm. the furthest thing from my mind. Nonetheless, I capitalized on, on everything. There's, you know, there's really no wrong way or no right way. And the album's been celebrated. And since that album was released from here, from here on forward, my focus is on singles instead of full length albums for a number of reasons. It costs a lot of money to manufacture discs and send four and 500 discs to radio and to print for, um, for review and people are in the digital download business these days. So there's really no point in me releasing full on albums anymore. I'd rather have one song out on the radio at a time and people can buy those. I'm not into Spotify. I think, I think we're going to stop Spotify after the first of the year too. It, mm. it, there's just no money in it for the artists. They're, the, right. It's streaming. It's a penny business. You're getting mm. paid pennies on the dot. It, it, for me, it's not working anymore. Yeah. And, and I'm always trying to, you know, let my money earn money, not lose money. Yes. And it, when you record an album, you know, it could be a twenty to a thirty thousand dollar venture from the time you book the studio, have the arrangements written, uh, hire the musicians you want to use hire the sound engineer, um, everything from, from your booking the studio to hours logged in, to the arrangements, to the musicians, to hiring the, the right promotion staff to make sure your record gets seen in print and heard on the radio. And every time you, you, you cut an album and you're talking about 20,000 to $30,000 times six albums, you know, it's very hard unless you're on a major, major label to recoup anything. The nice thing about, or to recoup all, all the money's put in. Um, the nice thing is product sales uh, at the venue, you know, but people are buying less and less, you know, at the venues. I can bring in, a, I can ship a box, a 30 count box of CDs to any performance venue that I'm in. And I might sell 10 or eight or 12, but the days of really buying a lot of discs are, they're, it's falling by the wayside. People are, are it's, it's a new technology, it's a new world. It keeps changing, right? Um, vinyl has made its way back into the mainstream. And uh, some of my music is definitely on vinyl, but it's also very expensive to press vinyl. Um, so you have to weigh the cost factor and decide what's right for you. And each artist is, has its own set of guidelines and, and budgetary uh, constraints. And if you're on a major label and you don't own the masters, fortunately I own everything, um, then the record label has to get paid back from the sales of of all the albums so they can recoup all the recording costs until the artist makes a dime. So, you know, it's, it's a crazy business. There's a lot of musicians out there that are phenomenal musicians, but if they have a really good business sense and they're educated about how the record business works, it'll be to their advantage. No. Oh. And businesswoman you mentioned, and I believe it runs in the family. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to segue to mention your father, Harry Cousins, who is a very successful Detroit entrepreneur, you know, outfitting several Motown legends uh, as a clothing owner and tailor. How did exposure to these Motown legends through your dad's store, you know, influence you growing up? When I was a tiny munchkin, like, you know, eight, nine years old, I, I used to, you know, they gave me menial, menial tasks in the store and 
I was a wide-eyed kid. And when I saw people like Marvin Gaye and Barry Gordy and Franklin and Diana Ross and all their kids and all their boyfriends and their husbands, they were always in that store constantly. And it was a cast of characters. It was very colorful. And so, and Motown was the radio station. I mean, Motown was the record label today. And all you heard were these songs on the radio, uh, CKLW and a few other AM radios. It was AM radio. And um, I think as a little kid, it, it had a huge impact on me. And I think it got into my, it seeped somehow into my DNA. I, I was a product of my environment. I saw my father working and communicating and wooing these customers of, of his. And he, he, he was a magician. He could sell an ice chest to an Eskimo and they all loved my father. They all loved him. Everybody, every customer, if you came in off the street and you were a blue collar factory worker, you would get the same respectful treatment uh, from the time you purchased the suit to had it fitted to the time you picked it up, whether, whether it be like blue collar factory workers or politicians like Ted Kennedy or the mayor of Detroit at the time was Coleman Young. It didn't matter who you were. Everyone was treated wonderfully in that store. And, you know, I never wanted to go into the field. My, my dad wanted all, all of us kids to go into the family business and none of us wanted it. We, we wanted nothing to do with it. We all went our separate ways. And I ended up in music. And I don't think I made the correlation until many, many, many years later. And then I, I started thinking about how many gigs have I had in my life in colleges and universities where I've gone and taught and been an artist in residence. And I, it, I've been, I sold one venue at a time, whether it was a university or an institution like that or a performing arts center. Um, and I think, again, you know, it, I inherited sales from my dad just from being around him, not because I said, Dad, will you teach me? Yeah. It's a very special story. And, and I think we had mentioned before talking a little bit, you at one point would love to get a book going, right, about your, about your father and his legacy. I I have a title. I would love to write a book uh, about Cousins Clothes and its crazy cast of characters. I mean, you know, I told you there was a tailor shop. There was a back room for the high-end suits. There was a haberdashery. There was my grandmother from Poland sitting uh, behind the counter. And she could, you know, if you came in and you tried to steal anything, she would catch it. And, you know, pimps would walk into the store and buy thousands of dollars worth of clothing and drop sacks, paper bags with money on the desk and she would count it all. It, it was just a, it was, it was like out of a movie. It's like out of a movie. And I would title it the King of the Cloth because that's who my father was. And, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it would be a huge undertaking. I would have to try and find customers and people that work there and a lot of people have since passed away or moved away it would be a huge project and you know there's a, there's only so many people alive in my direct surrounding that I could ask you know my mother's quite old and she has a lot of memories but you know my grandparents are gone and people have passed away that worked in that store there's so many stories that I could I could accrue I could accumulate a lot of stories, but then I'd need somebody to help me write the book. Yeah, yeah. And I'm writing music and I'm painting. So can, you can do a lot of things, but you, you can't spread yourself quite so thin all the time. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. Well, I wanted to just ask you one more question with the time we have left. You know, given your perspective, vast perspective and insight into the rapidly evolving industry, looking at young artists, nowadays, you know, starting careers in music, what advice might you have for them trying to launch a career right now? They need mentors around them, uh, people that have already been there, done that, that can guide them. And guidance is, is really good, but you have to get it from the right people. 
I wasn't that focused. I did many, many things. And I'm glad I did many, many things. But I was focused on one thing for five minutes and then I was on to the next. So a uh, focus factor is really, really important. Finishing projects, um, studying the business end of the music business to make sure that you're on top of the newest and the latest technologies and how things are working and what will work for you versus what won't work for you. Um, raising capital so you can put your creations to, to the public. A lot of young people are doing what I never did. Most of the people today that are recording have controllers and home studios and they can record at home, which is a lot different than when I first started making records and I never really learned the technology. I just went into the studio and um, we recorded there. Everything was done there. Overdubs were done later. A lot of times I did a lot of my own overdubs when it came to vocals. Younger people today have far more tools of the trade and and the insight and the technology skills than I do personally. And so the cost factor will come down quite significantly because uh, the younger people that have all these tools of the trade can save a whole lot of money on studio time. Studio time is very expensive, but when you have the MIDI controllers and all of the, all of the fun little tools and the gizmos and the toys, you can spend hours on them and delete and re-record. So uh, you're saving a ton of money in the studio. So I think that's a real upside to what the younger uh, music world or musicians are, are doing right now. And I think it's a money saver and, and they can spend unlimited time perfecting and retracing their steps and recutting if they need to. And then they can use their money stream uh, for other projects to facilitate the project that they're recording. My painting began in around 1990 and no lessons, just picked up a brush and started experimenting. It's, it was an experiment. And I found that I really gravitated toward a canvas and acrylic paints and, and a brush. It, it gave me a sense of re release from the day-to-day -day grind of the music. It's taken me far. I'm selling my artwork. I have a studio. I have a gallery within the studio. I paint from the stage. I will allow, uh, I'll let the band blow a, a tune or two, an instrumental, and I'll paint from right from the stage. And I've been in gallery shows. I've had, I've been in over 20 solo shows uh, since probably 2005. And I love it. And it, 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 it's an extension of my music. My, my artwork tends to be very musical. Um, a lot of it is, is, is jazz based. I even teach a clinic called Improvisation on Canvas. And it's a painting to jazz clinic where I guide the students into hearing color and seeing sound based on the music that I program. And it's usually Miles Davis or uh, Thelonious Monk or Charlie Parker. And um, I've been at performing arts schools with it. I've been at colleges. I've as little as, as kindergartners. And what comes out of these students that have maybe never picked up a paintbrush in their life is pretty amazing work. So mm -hmm. painting uh, during this entire pandemic has really kept me going. Um, it gives me a way to create. And I've also been promoting my artwork and working, uh, taking commissions and selling existing work right out of my studio here. In fact, I just shipped a painting a week ago to Berlin. So I'm selling, I'm shipping artwork all over the country and even, even across, even across the world. And, uh, I and really the one behind it. you sold, correct? The one, the one behind is a four foot square canvas. Um, it's called Parallel Universe mm -hmm. and it's sold to a couple that are redoing a room in their home. They're turning a, a sun porch into an all seasons, into an all seasons room. So they wanted this painting for their wall. And um, 
people, anybody that's interested in my artwork can find me and talk to me. I work in all sizes. I happen to love square. My smallest are 12 inch, 10 to 12 inch, and my largest are four and six foot. I mean, I did a six foot square. It was massive. I'm, I also like four feet by three feet, both portrait and landscape size. So that's, that's become a very popular size. I had three pop-up gallery shows in my yard um, over the summer and people came in and they either commissioned me or they bought right out of my yard. It's like selling uh, records out of the trunk of your car. I love painting. It's, it's stabilized me and it's, and it's really, um, it puts me in a meditative state when I'm working. I think it'll be with me now forever. That's very special. Well, the painting behind you is absolutely beautiful and, and it's gorgeous. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate you being on Hannah's Corner and joining us and sharing your insight. And, you know, as a veteran of the industry and in every facet, I really appreciate you, you sharing your time today with us. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I, I hope we meet, we get to meet in person. Yes. Stay safe and stay well and, and, and uh, continued success on your music and your painting. Thank you so much, Hannah. You too. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye.